Welcome back, everyone, to the fifth and final part of Henry Ford uh, by Extra History. Uh, we combined one and two and three and four into episodes, so this will be a little shorter today. If you haven't seen the first two reaction episodes of this series, the link is in the description below that will take you back to the beginning. And as always, please make sure we're supporting our original content creators. Go over, subscribe, give them a like on some videos, watch some stuff, and uh, let's encourage them to keep making interesting content that gives us an opportunity to talk a little more about history. With all of that said, we're going to go ahead and dive in to Henry Ford, A Tragic End. Highland Park Plant, Dearborn, Michigan, 1927. The photographer takes the photo, the flash illuminating Henry and Edsel Ford as they stand between Ford's old quadricycle and the 15 millionth Model T. They get inside the car with two other executives and drive it in a parade to commemorate the event. But the tone isn't celebratory. It's funereal. No one's talking. Days ago, Henry and Edsel had a massive blowout. The usually meek Edsel had finally taken a stand. To survive, the company needs to move on from the Model T. Sales are flagging. It's boxy and unstylish. Barely changed since 1908. Meanwhile, their competitors are now pumping out yearly models and selling cars on installment. Not to mention Henry Ford's anti-Semitic articles have... So, great point there. I mean, the, the modern idea of how cars are made and purchased was happening, but not with Ford, right? The idea of a new model coming out every single year... Uh, the idea of being able to finance a car and make payments on it instead of just having the money to buy it outright is something that's going to make it available to more people. Uh, and sometimes that's the problem with people who are successful is they can get so married to their previous success that they're afraid to, to move on and try something new because they finally found something that worked. Uh, but his son's 100% right here triggered a boycott against the company. With the Model T, Ford had created the modern age, but he increasingly loathes the world he helped make, as well as the son set to succeed him. I want to pause and just make a general observation. I feel like I've been doing a lot of these in this series, but um, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that a lot of people in history are... I mean, well, everybody is imperfect, but some people in history are particularly flawed human beings. And it's okay to, to simultaneously acknowledge that they were flawed, sometimes awful people, and still recognize the greatness of their achievements. They, it doesn't have to be either or. We can't, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater to use an expression. That just because Henry Ford, especially later in life, displayed some pretty awful characteristics in his life, it doesn't mean that the things he achieved weren't still great. It's the same thing with us deciding that we just can't honor someone like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson for their achievements because they also happen to be slave owners. And we find the fact that humans owned other humans to be despicable, which it was. Uh, if you go digging into people's lives, you're going to find that a lot of our heroes from history, even some that we don't like to talk about having dark sides, had some pretty dark sides to them. It's okay to acknowledge both. Today's story of the tragic end of an American icon is made possible by Nebula, where you can watch this and all of our episodes without ads like this one for Nebula. You get it. In 1927, the Ford Motor Company released their new Model A, its first new car since the Model T. Henry Ford contributed the engine work, while Edsel took care of the body, giving it a classic silhouette and modern styling. It also came in a variety of colors and body styles, and was the first vehicle with a safety glass windshield. But not only the car was different, the company that had produced it had changed significantly, and so had Henry Ford. By this time, he'd forced out so many executives that only a few, Sorensen among them, were left from those early days. Ford was isolated, increasingly stubborn, and prone to lash out. And his favorite target for this ire was tragically his own son, Edsel. 
Now, everybody at the plant loved Edsel. He was quiet, a team player, fair-minded, and generally kind. And while he didn't have his father's engineering ability, he did love automobiles, he knew the company inside and out, and had a good eye for what modern consumers wanted. And I wonder how much of that, his popularity, his easygoing nature, his ability to get along with people, made him the target of ire from his father who did not possess the qualities that made him as endearing to people uh, as his son was. I wonder if that's some of the level of resentment that was happening here. But his high class education had also alienated him further from his father. He hung around with the sons of the rich in Gross Point, mm. which his father hated. He smoked and drank alcohol. To his father, Edsel came to represent all of the things about the modern age that he hated. The easy morality, the short skirts, the cocktail parties and theater. Though Ford had handed the presidency to Edsel in 1919, in reality, the father was still calling all the shots. Hmm. He berated and undercut Edsel in front of the board, verbally abused him, and when he was away, broke into his house to smash his liquor bottles with a cane. Yeah, I just, uh, I have such a hard time with the idea of treating your son this way. Uh, maybe it's just because it's so important to me as a father that I don't do these things. Listen, are there things that my kids say and do that I don't like? Sure. I mean, uh, my daughter and I, she's 18, have very different views on the world, uh, even as far as politics and things like that go. But as far as I'm concerned, as long as she is educated on the issues, as long as she knows what she's talking about, and as long as she's willing to listen and talk, good for her. I'm glad she's taking an interest in that stuff. She doesn't have to think the same way I do, so long as she thinks. So it really frustrates me to no end to see him treating his son this way. When Edsel started digging a foundation for a new building without Henry's approval, Ford ordered the work to stop and the hole to never be filled in. So Edsel had to drive by it every day on his way to work. Once, when Edsel started tinkering with a new engine, Ford invited him to see a new conveyor-fed scrapping machine at the plant. To Edsel's horror, the first item fed into that scrapper was his new engine. Part of this was an attempt to provoke Edsel, to try to bring out the hard-edged anger Ford was so famous for because he perceived his son as a weakling and wanted to toughen him. Instead, it just beat Edsel down. But Ford, for his part, could not find peace at the plant anymore either. He'd fought hard and broken relationships in order to build the massive River Rouge plant, only to find he hated being there. <laughs> Highland Park was manageable, but the Rouge was a 900-acre city. The noise, the heat, the constant movement was intolerable for him. Increasingly, Ford withdrew to his other great project, Greenfield Village. Spent Good. Go out there, be by yourself, and don't bother anybody anymore. That's the way I look at it. Millions. Ford had not only reconstructed the home of his youth, but bought and relocated to it buildings of historic or architectural value from across the United States. He had a Museum of American Technology and managed to find and purchase not only all of his old race cars, but the first Westinghouse steam engine he ever worked. There, he immersed himself in an illusion of his childhood version of America, the one he'd helped kill. I don't like the way the country's going, so I'm just going to pretend like it doesn't exist and make my own little version of it. Oh, boy. Wow. He did farm work, which he'd always avoided as a child, and also got strange ideas. Among the most disastrous of which was Brazil. Fordlandia, a rubber plantation in the Brazilian Amazon where Ford wanted workers to produce low-cost rubber while living in an American-style utopian community that he'd personally designed down to the menu offerings. In fact, Fordlandia was so bananas, we already did a whole series of shorts on it that you might have seen. But Ford was not the only one feeling restless and depressed. Workers at the Rouge began to fall behind and feel the pressure, especially as Ford increased their workload and conditions worsened. And the workers started thinking they needed to organize. But in their way was the one man that Ford did still listen to, Harry Bennett. A former Navy sailor and amateur boxer that Ford had hired by happenstance in 1916, Bennett's first act on appearing at the Ford plant was to get in an argument and punch a man in the throat. As head of the service department, Ford's security wing, Bennett ruled the Rouge. He and his crew, a group of boxers, athletes, and low-level gangsters, spied on employees. So this all seems really weird to us now. Uh, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. It seem weird to you. But 
pretty common thing at this time in history, especially when unions are coming on the scene and and you have these large companies that have thousands of workers. Uh, very often the owners of these companies would hire private security teams to help deal with any potential issues like this. And it occasionally led to violence and even death. I mean, you have instances like uh, in Homestead outside of Pittsburgh where they brought in the Pinkertons and you actually had almost like a mini battle going on with gunfire on both sides. It was brutal stuff. Bennett terminated workers for owning a non-Ford car for taking too long in the bathroom. Now that, that's kind of interesting, the terminating workers for owning a non-Ford car, because as I mentioned in a previous episode, I live very close to where there had been a pretty large General Motors assembly plant in Lordstown. And in fact, you know, growing up, probably half my classmates, their parents worked at GM. That was just the big employer in this area after all the steel mills closed. Um, and there, a lot of times we would go to weddings and graduation parties that would be held in, if they were in Lordstown, they'd be held at the, uh, the union hall there. It was one of the places you could rent out or use for a party. Uh, and they had signs at the union hall that said, no non-union cars allowed in this parking lot. So if you drove, say, a Hyundai that was uh, made by non-union workers, you were banned from parking in that parking lot. Famously wealthy, he raised lions for fun and would walk them around on a leash to intimidate employees. And if anyone breathed a word about organizing, his goons would beat him in the back room. Things became even rockier in 1929, when the Great Depression caused car purchases to dry up overnight. Mm. For the first time, Ford had to resort to massive layoffs, leading to tragedy. So if you have ever had family members who lived through the Depression and sh shared stories with you, I'm sure you've heard some of those stories. You know, at that point, the automobile is still one of those things that's considered kind of a luxury item. It's not really a, a necessary item. It's kind of like, you know, when I was growing up, and we got our first computer. It was a Commodore 64. At the time, you know, today, everybody's got a computer, right? In, in many cases, people have multiple computers in their house. And it, it's considered kind of a an everyday, kind of just assumed that you have one item. It wasn't always that way. At one point, it was a luxury item that only certain people had. And the car was the same way. And when you hit the Great Depression, a lot of people out of work or not making a lot of money, now you're just spending on the necessities and not on things that are seen as luxury items. My great-grandparents, for example, I remember famously hearing from them that they only made the, the interest payments on the mortgage for their house during the Depression. It was all they could afford was just to keep paying the interest so they weren't actually paying off the house at all. On March 7th, 1932, three to 5,000 unemployed workers marched from Detroit to the Rouge in the Ford Hunger March, demanding their jobs back. The marchers persevered through police tear gas and batons, then against fire hoses. But finally, police and Ford security opened up with firearms. Mm. Not just sidearms, mind you, but machine guns. Jeez. Harry Bennett ran his car close to the retreating crowd, firing a revolver out his window. Five workers died and 60 were injured. Five years later, when United Auto Workers members were handing out leaflets protesting wages and conditions at the Rouge, Ford security jumped them and beat them in front of reporters' cameras. Mm. The incident looked bad for Ford and helped force him to the negotiating table, officially signing a consent to organize his factory in 1935. So there again, it's all about the power of the press. And when you get that stuff out there publicly with documented evidence like photographs and reporters putting in the newspaper... Boy, that can have a big impact on things. Ford's name also continued to taint the brand. Adolf Hitler had admired Ford's writing on Jews, kept a life-size portrait of Ford in his office, and personally name-checked him in Mein Kampf. Yep. Ford had indirectly helped Germany rearm as well, hosting delegations from Germany and the Soviet Union, where he and other car manufacturers like GM freely shared the principles of mass production. Overseas, Ford plants further embedded these lessons. And it was for this, more than anything else, that in 1938, the Nazi state awarded Ford the Grand Cross of the German Eagle, the highest award that could be bestowed upon a foreigner, and Ford happily accepted. This was not the behavior America wanted to see. No. Particularly after 1941, when Ford was given government contracts to make Sherman tanks, B-24 bombers, and jeeps for the American war effort. 
Ironically, Ford Motor Company's German branch, now severed from its American parent company, was simultaneously using slave labor to make war machines for the Third Reich. Ford's family issues deteriorated as well. He had Harry Bennett spy on Edsel and continued to berate and belittle him. Why was he so weak? Why did he look sick all the time? Oh, it's a liquor, no doubt. Then when Edsel revealed that he had stomach cancer, his father didn't stop. This was his fault, Ford said, for poor living. If how on earth? I mean, I don't care what you've done at this point. How on earth when your son gets a diagnosis of something like stomach cancer, which is almost certainly terminal in the 1940s, how do you not at that point say, you know what? Okay, maybe I need to rethink the way I've been treating him. But I guess when you're that far gone down that road, there's no coming back. If Edsel would only cut out dairy and exercise more, it would go away. It would not. Edsel Ford, who had loved automobiles since he was a toddler, watching his father test drive the quadricycle, died at the age of 49. <laughs> Ford, grieving and remorseful, stepped in as temporary president. Yet by that time he was 79 and had secretly suffered a stroke. He did little and was largely a puppet of powerful executives like Sorensen and Bennett. Angry, he forced Sorensen out, only to be confronted by his wife and daughter, who threatened to sell their stock to those outside the family if he did not resign. After trying and mm. failing to make Bennett president, he turned the company over to his grandson, Henry Ford II. And the young Ford's first act was to fire Harry Bennett. Good for him. Henry Ford died in 1947. At the age of 83, his wife Clara and a longtime friend, likely his mistress, at his side. During the public viewing, 5,000 people passed his casket per hour. Then they explored the rest of Greenfield Village, America as it once was, and reflected on the brilliant, complicated, and frequently terrible man who had changed their country from these farmhouses and dirt streets to the world's foremost economic power, a boy who hated horses. Hmm. Ford's story is an... Yeah, so like I said at the beginning, uh, we don't have to separate the flawed man from the achievement. We can recognize both and we should talk about both but we don't have to disregard the achievement because of the terrible human being responsible for it uh it's complicated all history is it's all nuance it's all gray it's not it's very rarely black and white and uh it's important for us to take a look at all this stuff and then kind of make our our judgments from there so let me know your thoughts use a comment section below and we'll see you again soon with another video thanks for watching